Some albums go beyond tunes. They tell stories. The Downward Spiral by Trent Reznor, dropped on March 8, 1994, is one of those gems. It's about a main character losing everything until there's nothing left. It's a deep dive into struggle and darkness. Trent, the brain behind Nine Inch Nails, created this concept album that's more than just music. It's a trip from spooky sounds to deep emotions. This album didn't just make noise. It made Nine Inch Nails 90s rock legends, influencing tons of other artists. But how did Trent pull off this sound magic? Why did he explore the gloomy side of life? And when the album hit, what did it achieve? And how did it change the music scene? Let's find out in this video. The Downward Spiral didn't just happen overnight. It was born from a time when things were getting pretty weird for Nine Inch Nails. They were tearing up the stage at Lollapalooza, breaking stuff and leaving chaos behind. But Trent was feeling out of place. To top it off, he was having a fallout with TVT Records. So he and his manager, John Malm Jr., decided to start their own thing, Nothing Records. At the same time, Trent was cooking up the idea for the album, a dark story about a guy rebelling against everything, giving God the boot, and taking a dive into the deep end. Heavy stuff, right? Now, Trent was dealing with some personal battles, struggles with stuff we won't sugarcoat. So he wanted the downward spiral to be a whole mood something different from their raw sound and broken. He switched things up, ditching the usual guitar and synth sounds for a fresh vibe. Armed with his trusty Mac computer, he got busy with music editor programs and Pro Tools, messing with sounds like a mad scientist. He brought in some cool friends for the album, Stephen Perkins, Adrian Ballou, and Chris Vrenna. Ballou rocked the guitar for Mr. Self-Destruct, playing it free and wild. Trent loved it, saying the guitar felt more expressive than a keyboard. Vrenna and Perkins banged out live drum parts, later turned into looped samples. Trent got creative, sampling and distorting guitar and drum parts to tell the album's story. He used fancy tech like Digidesign's TurboSynth and Zoom 9030 effects unit. Drums were a mix of live ones, drum machines, and movie samples. Plus, he played around with a bunch of gear like Oberheim OBMX, Minimoog, Prophet VS keyboard, and more. During this time, Trent was living in the house where Sharon Tate's life took a tragic turn. Patty Tate, Sharon Tate's sister, confronted him, asking if he was exploiting her sister's death. It hit Trent hard. He realized that he was in a place with some messed up history. Flood, the British producer, joined the ride, but later bailed due to creative differences. Trent had a wild song, Just Do It, but Flood said it was too much. The final track, Big Man with a Gun, wrapped up late in 1993. After recording, Trent left the Tate house and it was bulldozed. Mixing and mastering happened at Record Plan and A&M Studios with Alan Mulder. It turned out to be Flood's last dance with Nine Inch Nails. The downward spiral was ready to hit the world, packed with Trent's intense journey and a sound that flipped the script. Now, let's dig into the layers of Trent Reznor's masterpiece. This album isn't just a bunch of songs. It's a deep dive into a world filled with metaphors that you can explain in many ways. The album has this vibe of, I don't care about anything, and explores themes like self-struggle and trying to keep it together. It's kind of like Trent's personal diary, a journey into his own world, spiraling down through struggles with religion, dehumanization, violence, disease, society, drugs, sex, and finally, some heavy stuff we won't spell out. Trent described it as someone letting go of everything, reaching a potential nothingness through career, religion, relationships, and beliefs. Now, the sound of this album is like a musical buffet, grabbing bits from techno, dance, electronic, heavy metal, and hard rock. It's a mix that gives you industrial rock, alternative rock, industrial metal, and even art rock. Trent goes wild with noise, distortion, and doesn't follow the usual song structure. It's a journey through unconventional sounds, with metal guitars from his previous work, Broken, making a comeback. Mr. Self-Destruct is like a powerful storm, starting with sounds sampled from a 1971 film and building up with an industrial roar. The Becoming takes you into a place where the protagonist turns into something non-human. Closer wraps up with a cool piano tune that shows up in different songs, creating this cool connection. 
Trent didn't just pluck these sounds out of thin air. He took inspiration from David Bowie's experimental album Low and Pink Floyd's The Wall, both known for their deep themes and unique structures. Now, let's talk about the packaging. The album cover isn't just eye candy, it's a piece of art called Wound. Russell Mills, the artist behind it, wanted to play with layers, both physically and conceptually. The artwork is like a beautiful surface that hints at the raw struggles beneath. Imagine plaster, acrylics, oils, rusted metals, insects, moths, a bit of the artist's blood, wax, varnishes, and surgical bandaging all coming together on a wooden panel. It's a visual representation of the intense journey you're about to embark on when you hit play on the downward spiral. The singles from the album, like March of the Pigs and Closer, hit the airwaves with distinct vibes. March of the Pigs played with unique rhythms, experimenting with time signatures like a musical acrobat. Its music video underwent a tumultuous process, with the initial version scrapped due to Trent's perfectionism, and the second, a raw, live performance making its way to screens. Closer introduced an interesting twist by sampling Iggy Pop's Night Clubbin. Lyrically, it delves deep into self-hatred and obsession. However, it faced misinterpretation as a lust album, thanks to its infamous chorus. The music video, a creation by Mark Romanek, was a wild visual journey with controversial imagery, earning a place in the Museum of Modern Art after MTV's graphic censorship. Piggy added a recurring line, Nothing can stop me now, weaving connections between tracks. Trent's impromptu live drumming on the outro, initially just a studio test, made it onto the record. Released as a promotional single, it even secured a spot on the Billboard Modern Rock Tracks chart. Fast forward to 1995, and Hurt entered the scene, addressing struggles with self-harm and navigating through the challenges of a certain substance. It's a heavy piece, reflecting Trent's raw and honest lyrical style. The journey didn't stop with the singles. It extended into the self-destruct tour. The concerts weren't just musical performances, they were chaotic spectacles. Violence, instrument destruction, band members roughhousing, and even stage dives into the crowd were all part of the show. Woodstock 94 marked a turning point, with Nine Inch Nails covered in mud, stealing the spotlight and expanding their fan base. Mud wasn't a gimmick, it was a result of pre-concert backstage antics. Their intense performance earned them a Grammy, catapulting them into the mainstream. The main leg of the tour featured Marilyn Manson, and together they created creative chaos. Despite a few bumps, the tour entered the annals of rock history as one of the top opening acts. Technical hiccups aside, the performances left fans both drained and exhilarated. After more tour legs and collaboration gigs with David Bowie, they wrapped it up with Knights of Nothing, a showcase of Nothing Records bands. Richard Patrick briefly rejoined for a gig, infusing some guitar magic. Post-tour, Chris Vrenna bid farewell, leaving a lasting impact on Nine Inch Nails' epic journey. The downward spiral faced its fair share of twists and turns before making its mark. Trent Reznor, the mastermind behind it, encountered delays, slowing down the album's intended pace. These pauses allowed him to set up Le Pig, a studio with a peculiar name, and gave him time to explore new songwriting approaches that broke away from his previous works. The album's release on March 8th of 1994 marked an instant success. Debuting at number two on the US Billboard 200, it sold nearly 119,000 copies in its first week. The Recording Industry Association of America, or RIAA, certified it quadruple platinum by October of 1998, and by December of 2011, it had reached 3.7 million copies sold in the United States. Across the pond, it peaked at number nine on the UK albums chart, earning a gold certification by the British Phonographic Industry, or BPI, in 2013. In Canada, it climbed to number 13 on the RPM albums chart, securing a triple platinum certification from the Canadian Recording Industry Association, or CRIA. The journey to completion was far from conventional. Early listeners viewed it as commercial suicide, but Reznor wasn't driven by profit. His goal was to broaden Nine Inch Nails' scope slightly. Despite initial doubts, the finished product surprised Reznor with 
a success, leading to questions about a follow-up single and a music video on MTV. To date, the album has sold over 4 million copies worldwide. Critics and audiences alike praise The Downward Spiral for its abrasive yet eclectic nature, exploring dark themes that revolved around the destruction of a man. The New York Times noted its highly abrasive music, contrasting it with other electro-industrial groups. Village Voice called it Hieronymus Bosch as post-industrial atheist, and Rolling Stone likened it to cyberpunk fiction. Entertainment Weekly summarized it as Reznor's pet topics wrapped in hooks that hit your psyche like a blowtorch. The accolades poured in, with the album landing on numerous best-of lists. Rolling Stone's 500 greatest albums of all time included it at number 200, later moving it up to number 122 in 2020. Spins, 125 best albums of the past 25 years, listed it at 10, emphasizing its bleak, aggressive style. Guitar World acknowledged it in their super unknown 50 iconic albums that define 1994 list. Loudwire rated it second on its 10 best hard rock albums of 1994, and it found a spot in Robert DeMurray's book, 1001 Albums You Must Hear Before You Die. The Downward Spiral remains not just an album, but a pivotal piece in the musical tapestry, earning its place among the iconic works of the 90s. If you enjoyed this musical journey through Trent Reznor's The Downward Spiral, please don't forget to like and subscribe for more engaging content about music history.